All right, so uh, we got our holiday week this week, right? I'm sure everybody's well aware. Um, so we got one lecture and we're gonna do this new topic, nuclear chemistry. Uh, we're gonna dive right in here, no daily quiz for today. Um, I'm pretty sure we're gonna be able to wrap this up and this is the last topic of the semester, right? Our last new content is this chapter right here, okay? So, nuclear chemistry, what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at some of these reactions that we've been covering, right? So like a very common reaction in organic chemistry that you would learn would be something like this. This is a very common reaction that would take place between covalent molecules. And importantly, what I'm sort of trying to stress here, let's actually draw this out. In this reaction here, we have bonds that are being broken, right? In particular, this carbon-hydrogen bond over here and this bromine-bromine bond over here. And then we have bonds being formed. All right, so this hydrogen bromine bond and this carbon bromine bond is a very typical reaction that occurs between organic molecules. All right, and this is characteristic of a lot of chemical reactions. Chemical reactions are about making and breaking bonds. And importantly, what are bonds made of? We got our three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons. What is being shared that creates a covalent bond? the electrons, right? So if I'm breaking bonds and then forming new bonds, I'm shuffling around electrons in these molecules, right? I'm changing who's bonded to who. So when we talk about a chemical reaction, right? This is our typical chemical reaction. We have bonds being broken and bonds being formed. And again, Bonds are made of electrons. We talked a lot last week about redox reactions, right? And what occurs in a redox reaction that makes it its own little category. You have an exchange of which subatomic particle? Electrons, right? So up until now, every chemical reaction that we've talked about is all about just moving electrons around. That's what like 99.9% .9 of chemical reactions are. All right, nuclear reactions are very special. They sit in their own little category. To be honest, if you are a nuclear chemist, that's all you do is study this one particular world, okay? Nuclear reactions they occur within the nucleus. Okay, so these are going to be a very special type of reaction here. You're not making or breaking bonds. This is a reaction that's occurring within the nucleus. And let's talk about the nucleus because I know that this is something that was gone over at some point at the very beginning of your chemistry career and then maybe never thought about again. Importantly, what two subatomic particles live in the nucleus? the protons and the neutrons. So right, again, a special type of chemical reaction where I'm not talking about the electrons anymore. Most chemical reactions are all about the electrons. These aren't. These are all about what's going on in the nucleus and specifically with those two subatomic particles, protons and neutrons. Okay. Um, important properties, basic properties of both of these subatomic particles that is very different from electrons is that these two particles have mass associated with them. Truthfully, an electron does as well, but like 0.001% of these guys here. So electrons are not like perfectly light like a photon is. They do have some mass, 
but the vast majority of the mass in an atom is held in the nucleus, in these two subatomic particles, right? So importantly, we're gonna say these have mass. All right, and the other basic thing that we know about these two subatomic particles is their charge. They have a different amount of charge compared to an electron, which has a charge of minus one. What does a proton have a charge of? Plus one. And then neutrons have a charge of zero. They're neutral, all right? Okay, so now we have our first big conundrum about the nucleus here, is what do we know about uh, opposite charges, right? Opposites attract. So a proton is attracted to an electron, great. Uh, but then, okay, so now I have this nucleus where if I'm taking an atom, for example, you know, even something like carbon, I'm packing six protons into this one dense nuclei, and like charges repel one another. Right? So how am I packing together all this like charge into this stable nuclei? All right? So this is something that plagued chemists for a really long time, and it wasn't until quantum mechanics came around and they were able to explain the complicated crap that's going on there. Both of these, proto uh, both of these particles here are what are called nucleons. It's a special class of particle in particle physics. Honestly, I know nothing about particle physics other than to know I, I know nothing. But the bottom line is if you go and study particle physics, there's a large, uh, you know, few different categories of particles that exist out there. Protons and neutrons sit in one category. Electrons sit in a different category. The category that these sit in are what are called nucleons. And nucleons have this very special type of interaction with fellow nucleons. And they got really, really creative in naming this. This is what they called the strong force. All right, we know about like gravity and uh, Opposites attract, like charges, right? These different forces that exist out in nature. It turns out that there's another one that is very specific to this category of particle, which is what's called a strong force. So this is this interaction between nucleons. And as the name implies, it's strong. So yes, you have this, what would be called like a coulombic interaction of repulsion between these protons. But way stronger is this strong force that exists that's helping keep things together, okay? Moreover, that's also kind of the role that a neutron plays is it doesn't have that charge. So it helps kind of spread things out a little bit while still holding everything together with this strong force here. And what you see is the larger an atom is, the more neutrons it will have to kind of help balance things out. Not really balance, I don't want to say balance. Help uh, spread out that positive charge and keep that strong force, that strong force specific to nucleons as kind of the dominant force holding things together. All right, so this is why nuclei, uh, this is why nucleus of an atom doesn't just like spontaneously fall apart. We're all still here today. We're cool, right? Why aren't we just disintegrating with our like repels like charges? Because again, they have this special force, what we call a strong force. Okay, so first thing that we need to do with a nuclear equation. So first of all, let's take a look at it, and we're going to learn how to balance. these nuclear equations. All right, so a common radioactive element, an element that will undergo one of these nuclear reactions, you've probably heard of uranium-238, well, maybe not the specific isotope, but there's one particular isotope that we get of uranium, and that's what we use to power our nuclear power plants and unfortunately um, bombs and stuff like that, right? You take all the uranium in the world and then you filter out and you get one particular isotope, uranium-238, okay? So first of all, let's talk about this notation. 
this element right here, how we would name this, this is the symbol for a specific isotope, right? So we would call this uranium 238, name dash mass number, okay? So what is that 238? That's what we call the mass number. And the mass number is equal to the number of protons plus neutrons. All right. In the lower corner here, this is just the atomic number of uranium. If we go and look on the periodic table, uranium's element 92. All right. So this is just the number of protons. Remember that that atomic number corresponds to the number of protons that a particular element has. So if I'm talking about uranium, I'm specifically talking about an atom with 92 protons. All right, so then if I'm going to do this uh, math here, how many neutrons does this particular uranium isotope have? All right, I have my mass number is equal to the number of protons plus neutrons. I know my mass number is 238. And because this is uranium, its uh, number of protons is 92. Okay, so that means that my number of neutrons would be 146. Okay, and importantly, I guess let's just put this down. This is a term that we should know, but just in case, nope, that's not how you spell it. Isotope. An isotope is when you have the same element, but different number of neutrons. So this would be a specific isotope of uranium, a specific number of neutrons. There's many isotopes of uranium that exist. They all would have different mass numbers, but of course they have to have the same atomic number, otherwise it wouldn't be uranium anymore. Okay, so we're talking about a very specific isotope of uranium that we would call radioactive, meaning it undergoes a nuclear reaction. All right, so one of the particles that is produced in this nuclear reaction this is going to occur in the nucleus. This atom is literally going to split into two smaller atoms. That's what a nuclear reaction is, right? One of those is helium with a mass number of four. All right, and the question is, what is the other particle? This would be balancing this nuclear equation here. All right. Matter cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred here, right? So how am I going to balance this nuclear equation? Importantly, I just have to make sure that I have the same number of protons on both sides and the same number of neutrons on both sides, right? That's what we mean by balancing a nuclear equation. Balancing a nuclear equation, same number of protons and neutrons on both sides. So how many protons must this other atom that's produced have? Right, I got 92 in uranium. I broke this thing off and this little chunk has two. So the other 90 must be in my other element. Okay, so then what element am I talking about? We would just go to our periodic table here. We would find element 90, TH. I actually think it's got a pretty cool name if I remember correctly. It's like thorium or something. Yeah, it's thorium. Yeah. Yeah, anyways, uh, we're going to be talking about large elements a lot. So I'm down here. Two elements over, element 90 would be TH thorium. All right, and then lastly, I need my mass number. Well, remember, the number of protons and neutrons are conserved. So 238 minus the 4 that ended up over here gives me thorium-234.
All right, and again, this is a very typical nuclear reaction happening here, right? This is a reaction that's occurring within the nucleus of this atom. It's kind of breaking apart into these two smaller chunks. And if I'm going to balance this nuclear equation, I simply need to make sure that I have the same number of protons and the same number of neutrons on both sides. Not too crazy. All right, now, studying these nuclear reactions, they all tend to fall into one of a few bins here. And so we're going to talk about the types of nuclear reactions. All right, the first one is an example, uh, or rather we just saw an example of what's called alpha decay. All right, so that would be our uranium-238 decaying into that thorium-234. And helium-4, helium, not hydrogen. All right. This is a really, really common type of a nuclear reaction, a reaction that emits a helium particle. Okay. This is so common, in fact, that it gets its own name. All right. This helium-4 we call an alpha particle. All right. So a lot of nuclear reactions, it turns out, breaks off into these helium-4 atoms, and so it gets its own special name. We call it a alpha decay, and the helium-4 is the alpha particle. All right, other terminology for nuclear reactions, we would call the uranium the parent and thorium the daughter nuclei. So the big one's the parent, the little one's the daughter. Biology steals this, too, when they talk about DNA and replication and stuff, right? Cool. All right, so the next category, going down the Greek alphabet here, is beta decay. So carbon-14 is an unstable isotope of carbon. Okay. And what happens in carbon are in this beta decay is our daughter has an increase in the number of protons but the same mass number. Okay? And remember what the mass number is. It's the protons plus the neutrons, right? So what's happening here is we have a neutron being turned in to a proton. But to keep everything all balanced, this process emits an electron. So this is pretty cool. I mean, this is kind of the magic of nuclear chemistry here. We have a neutron being converted into a proton plus an electron. All right, and so if we just look, uh, oh, uh, I guess real quick, this is what we would call a beta particle, the electron in this case. Again, my parent would be the carbon, and my daughter would be the nitrogen. All right, and if we look at the consequence of this nuclear reaction here, the relationship between the parent and the daughter, our mass number stays the same, but the number of protons increases by one.
All right, and the last, the, the, these are like kind of the three most common. The last one would be what's called gamma ray emission. All right, and these typically accompany other forms of nuclear reactions, right? So we would have something like an alpha decay But this thorium that's produced is what they would call metastable. It gets this little M in its symbol here. And so what happens is this isotope that's produced here of thorium will immediately undergo yet another form of nuclear chemistry which we call the gamma ray emission. Where it emits a gamma ray, which is a high energy photon. So it's got zero mass and zero charge. OK. So then what's going to happen to my mass number and my number of protons based on what we learned about balancing? What's going to be the mass number of this other particle here? 234, right? It's got to all balance. What's going to be the uh, number of protons? 90. So it doesn't actually change the identity of the atom. It's just a way for this thing that got created that's got too much energy to blow off a little steam, to release some of that energy. So this is just thorium 234 again. It just loses that metastable M. We got two more classes of nuclear reactions to discuss, but before we go on, we're going to talk about these three and some and these two properties of these nuclear reactions. First of which is called ionizing power. Okay, these nuclear reactions, right? First of all, when we if we just think about it, we don't like carry out nuclear reactions in a beaker on the bench top in front of us, right? I mean, if we're thinking about a nuclear reactor, they build something that's like got three feet of concrete to surround this reaction so that it's very nice and contained, right? Why is that? Because these reactions release a ton of energy and these products, these alpha, beta, and gamma particles can do a lot of damage, all right? So when we talk about the ionizing power, we're kind of talking about how much damage that ejected particle can do, how much energy is being shot out into space when these reactions occur, right? So we can say the energy of our ejected particle. All right, and it turns out that the heaviest of these three particles here, right, um, to be clear, the alpha particle, again, that's that helium atom, right? A helium-4. We call it an alpha particle when it's a product of a, de of a nuclear reaction. Uh, the beta particle, that's just an electron. Again, we call it a beta particle when it's being shot out as the product of a nuclear reaction. And this gamma particle, this is just a photon, right? The same thing that's light, that light is made of. But it's a really, really high energy photon, right? We know about X-rays and how they're very high energy photons. These are even higher energy than that. OK, so where am I? My ionizing power of my ejected particle, it turns out that this is proportional to the mass that that particle has, where an alpha particle has the greatest ionizing power, followed by a beta particle, followed by a gamma ray. The gamma ray emission. Yeah. 
I don't know if you could say always, but yes, this is something that typically occurs other nuclear reactions. And again, the way that you would tell that is because it would be written with this little metastable script up there. Okay, the other thing that we rank these at that we gotta be worried about is what we call the penetrating power. And this is just the ability of the particle to pass through a surface. Um, and here we see the exact opposite trend, where it's the smaller one that's able to kind of wiggle its way through surface atoms. So the gamma ray followed by the beta followed by the alpha particle. All right, so we got two more kind of, I don't know, more rare types of nuclear reactions, but nonetheless that do occur, and so we're going to make note here. The first one is what's called positron emission. All right. So let's say, for example, we have this unstable phosphorus 30. Phosphorus is element 15. Okay, this particular isotope of phosphorus is radioactive and it will decay in a positron emission. So we'll create a silicon 14, silicon's element 14, but the mass number stays the same. Okay, so what's going to be, if I'm going to balance everything out, what's got to be the subscript of this new particle that's formed here? 15 equals 14 plus what? 1. And what's going to be the mass number? 0. Can't change, right? So what the heck is this thing? This is not a proton, the positively charged particle we're used to. Otherwise, that would have a mass number of 1. All right, this is its own special thing. This is what's called a positron. All right, so it's kind of the opposite of what we saw for beta decay here. Here we have a proton being converted into a neutron and a positron. All right, so what the heck is a positron? Let's talk about this for a second, just because it's kind of cool. A positron is simply a positively charged electron. It's what we would call the anti particle of an electron. All right. So, turns out that again, I know nothing about like particle physics other than to know that I don't know anything, all right? But in the world of particle physics, we got all these particles that we've studied, right? Protons, neutrons, electrons, there's photons. It turns out that for some reason, theoretically, for every particle that exists, there also has to be an antiparticle that exists. And one of the big unsolved mysteries of the science world, if you're going for a Nobel Prize, you can go and study this because we still have no freaking idea why. 
Uh, the theory is, is that at the beginning of time in our universe, there was just about equal, part, equal amounts of antiparticles and particles, with just a small excess of particles. And they all find one another, and they collide, and they turn into just energy. So if you take a positron and an electron, and they combine together, they will be released as just a photon, a high energy photon. And so what exists here in the universe today is just all that leftover of that small excess of particles. So basically this positron that's ejected, it's going to go find an electron somewhere and just turn into energy. There's a lot of weird symmetry rules in high energy physics. This is kind of one of them. For every particle that exists, there has to be an antiparticle that also exists. There are antiprotons out there and antineutrons and all that jazz. OK, so then the last one here is what we call electron capture. If we take a ruthenium, 92, where does this dude live, 44? Okay, this is another unstable nuclei, but this one will actually absorb an electron. So now we have on our reactant side an electron. So balance this for me. Give me my product of this reaction here. Right, my mass number's got to stay the same, 92. My atomic number goes down to 43. If I look on my periodic table, element 43 is technetium TC. In nuclear chemistry, we talk about all of these elements that sound really funny because we've never talked about them up until this point because they're really big and well-behaved. All right, so electron capture, we have our nuclei reacting with an electron. So what happens is we have a proton plus an electron being converted to a neutron, right? Because my mass number stays the same, it's just my atomic number that goes down. And let's just, for these last two that we just studied here, let's make note. So here we have, in both cases, mass number stays the same. Atomic number goes down. Right? And that's the consequence of both of these types of nuclear chemistry. In both cases, you don't have any change in your mass number, but your atomic number goes down by one. All right, so then if we're given, we're told about an isotope, right? Uranium-238. How are we supposed to know what types of nuclear reactions that particular isotope will undergo? All right, so first of all, we're going to look at this chart here. All right, we're going to make sense of what's going on here. Okay, this is a plot of atomic number for all the different elements, right? So if I'm increasing in my atomic number, I'm moving down the periodic table or you know, counting across the periodic table here. So these are all my different isotopes that are, are all my different elements that are represented here. And then on the y-axis, we have the number of neutrons that are in that particular element, okay? And so you see if we zoom in here, our very small elements, 
right? The ones that we talk about when we talk about organic chemistry, the carbons and the nitrogens and the oxygens of the world, hydrogen, right? They tend to have the same number of protons as they do neutrons. So that's what this red line is here, is if you take the number of proton, uh, the number of neutrons and divide it by the number of protons, right? That would give you this line here with a slope of one. So our small elements, they tend to have the same number of neutrons as they do protons. But as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, you can see that this sort of deviates from that line. You gotta have more neutrons to help balance everything out, right? To keep those strong forces as the dominant forces, preventing the uh, like repels like interaction from kind of overtaking. All right, so then we got these two different colors on this chart. In green is all the known stable isotopes, all right? So for example, if I zoom in here and I look at this column right here, this all is representing different atoms that have the same atomic number, the atomic number 20, who is that? Potassium, nope, calcium, all right? So these are all different calcium isotopes here. The green ones, are the stable isotopes of calcium, right? They have the correct number of neutrons in there. The yellow are all the known unstable nuclei. So these yellow ones here will undergo some sort of nuclear reaction in order to become something stable, right? So again, a, col a particular column here represents an element, and within that column we see all the different isotopes of that element. Some of them are stable, those are the green ones. The yellow ones are the unstable. All right, so all unstable isotopes. All right, so let's say that I'm gonna pick this particular calcium isotope here. I know it's unstable, right? It's in this yellow box here. So it's gonna undergo some sort of nuclear reaction. And it really wants to get to one of those green boxes, right? It wants to become a stable nuclei. Well, in this case, because it's sitting above that green line, this would be an isotope that has too many neutrons, right? It's too many neutrons to be stable, okay? So we see these patterns here. When N over Z, is too high, meaning we're above that green line. Okay, again, these are elements that have too many neutrons, right? So let's just say that as well. Too many neutrons. All right, so what type of nuclear reaction are these isotopes, these particular isotopes gonna undergo? Well, beta decay is when a neutron gets converted to a proton. So that's a way to go down in your number of neutrons and also go up in the number of protons. And so that's what we're gonna see in this case. When N over Z is too high, these undergo beta decay. Okay, and if we look, if we zoom in here, what's gonna happen when this undergoes beta decay, it's going to lose a neutron and gain a proton, right? So it's gonna kind of migrate over towards that green line. And it's just gonna keep on doing that until it becomes a stable nuclei. Okay, these arrows were a little bit too big, but this chart's really small, so it's hard to draw them in. You get what I'm saying, right? We move this way for beta decay. All right, so then what if I did the opposite and I took this other calcium isotope down here, right? I picked one that has an N over Z that's too small. I.e. this dot sits below that green line. Has too few neutrons. All 
right? So those last two nuclear reactions that we studied All right, this is a way to make it so that your mass number stays the same, but the number of protons goes down, right? We get a proton being converted into a neutron. So both of these here would be viable options. So positron emission or electron capture. All right, which one it picks is going to be unique to this particular particle, but uh, either one of these would help you reach that green line. All right, this is now doing the opposite. If we're starting here, positron emission, we go down in the number of protons, geez, Louise, but up in the number of neutrons. This is not going to cooperate. Come on. So this way. It won't let me write on the picture. It goes that way and that way, right? To the right and then up. I don't know why it's not working. But anyways. All right. So then the last thing we want to note about this chart here is we kind of have like this magic cutoff that occurs in our atomic number. If you look, we got our green line, we got our green line, we got our green line, and then all of a sudden at element 83, it stops. There are no more stable isotopes after element 83, okay? So everything that's heavier than 83 is just inherently unstable. It will decay in some way, shape, or form. All right, so then our last thing is if Z is greater than 83, This is just too big. These will undergo both alpha decay and beta decay. And these reactions usually happen in like a chain here. Alpha, alpha, beta, beta, da, 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 right? Just a series of them. So if we look at that example that we did for our alpha decay, our uranium, Right, uranium-238, it's going to split up into this alpha particle and the thorium-90. We're still too big. So this is just going to go on and do another round of beta decay or alpha decay. And just keep going until it reaches one of those more stable nuclei, right? one of those smaller ones. So inside that uranium-238 nuclear reactor, it isn't just one sort of step in a nuclear reaction occurring. You kind of kick off this chain of events that then releases huge amounts of energy, which is what we capture and use to power buildings. All right, so what are we supposed to be able to do with this information here? Okay, so what would this type of problem look like? I could tell you something like the only stable isotope of fluorine is F19, right? Fluorine 19 is the only stable isotope. So then I could ask what type of nuclear reaction does fluorine 21 undergo? So fluorine, the only stable one, the only green dot on that chart under fluorine's category is the fluorine 19 isotope. So then I have fluorine 21. Is it stable? No, because I just told you the only stable one was fluorine 19, right? So then which, three which of these three categories would that fluorine 21 isotope fit under? Is the N over Z too high? Does it have too many neutrons? 
Is the N over Z too low? Does it have too few neutrons? Or is it just too freaking big because its atomic number is over 83? Okay. My mass number is 21, so I'm going up in my number of neutrons, right? So that would represent a dot sitting above this green line right here, or what we would say is our N over Z is too high. So this would undergo beta decay, right? N over Z too high. All right, another part, like element that you hear a lot with regard to nuclear chemistry is plutonium. What type of nuclear reaction? Does plutonium, I have no idea what its mass number would be. Sure. Two forty four undergo. All right, draw it out for me. Draw the chemical equation. Oh, I guess you'd have to pick one. Well, so everybody, take a second and figure out what type of nuclear reaction plutonium undergoes. All right, which one of our three categories does this fall into? Does this have too many neutrons, too few neutrons, or is it just too big? It's just too big, right? So then let's pick one here. I want you to give me my alpha decay chemical equation for the plutonium 244 atom. Remember, an alpha decay will necessarily create an alpha particle, which is that helium-4 atom. So then in order to figure it, so that's what I know. Anytime I say alpha decay, I know that this is going to be one of my particles that's produced. So then how do I figure out the other one? I just need to go back to that skill we discussed at the very beginning, balancing these nuclear equations, right? So my mass numbers have to total up. So that means this element has a mass number of 240. My protons have to total up. That means this element is 92. And who we've been talking about a bunch? This would be uranium, all right? And again, too big will just continue to undergo more and more of these decay reactions until it reaches one of those stable nuclei. Cool, all right.